Good morning, church. So my name is Tim Power. I'm one of the pastors here at Salem. And I, let me start by just saying this because I think it's important to say, God is good. God is good. Can you say that? God is good. Now, listen, when I say that, that does not mean this. It doesn't mean that everything in my life is going good. It does not mean that every circumstance is is a okay. It doesn't mean that I think everything in the world is going as it should. Um, no, it, it means this. It means that yes, there's darkness, but there's light that shines in the darkness, and, and, and the darkness cannot overcome the light. And that, that light is Jesus. And I, I really needed that time of worship today. And so I, w- I want to thank our worship team. I want to thank Tracy for leading us in worship. That was just, it was awesome. It was awesome. Um, we're wrapping up this week a sermon series that, that we started five weeks ago. It's called Belonging. We've been taking this deep dive into this story. It's a story uh, about Jesus and an encounter he has with a woman a Samaritan woman at a well. Uh, Like I said in the very first week that we talked about this, it's an important story. Here's how important it is. It is the longest conversation we have in Scripture that Jesus has with anybody. Longest conversation that Jesus has with anybody. And and it's a powerful template, I think, that we can look at as, as to how we can encounter Jesus, be transformed by Jesus, and then bear witness to Jesus. So, so, so that's how it works in the life of believers. First we encounter Jesus, then we're transformed by Jesus, and then we bear witness to what Jesus has done in our lives. That's, that's really what we call discipleship. That, that's what it means to become a deeper disciple. You encounter Jesus, you're transformed by Jesus, you bear witness to Jesus. And, and so what I want to do today is I want to kind of wrap this story up by by reading the last little bit of the story and, and see how this Samaritan woman who encountered Jesus, we've already seen that, and their, their conversation that they had was a transformative conversation. And what I want to see in this little bit of scripture that we're going to read today is how she bears witness to the goodness of God. So uh, a little bit of context to catch you up with the story in case you're unaware of, of what happens in this story. Jesus and his disciples, they're traveling through Samaria. I said this in the first week. That's significant. Jewish people at the time did not travel through Samaria, even though it looks like it's right in the middle of their country. It's basically like a neighborhood they wouldn't go to. Okay, That's what Samaria is like to them. They didn't like the Samaritan people. Uh, they, they had all sorts of biases against these people uh, for all sorts of reasons. I'd, I'd uh, encourage you to go back and listen to some of the earlier sermons where we kind of go in depth of why they had these feelings about the Samaritans. But, but suffice it to say today, they didn't like them. And, and the disciples didn't think they should even be traveling through that region. But Jesus is always willing to go anywhere and go any length to share good news. And, and uh, he will cross every boundary. And what you're going to find about the love of Jesus is that the love of Jesus is countercultural. It's countercultural. And so at about noontime this one day, Jesus and his disciples are traveling through uh, Sikar. And they, they uh, are at this well. Dis- the disciples go off to buy some food. And Jesus, um, Jesus stays waiting by the side of this well. And this woman comes up. And uh, Jesus starts talking to her. Uh, Again, Jewish men did not talk to Samaritans, much less Samaritan women. This was very much a social faux pas at the time. Um, But again, Jesus' love always goes beyond the bounds of culture. It always is counter-cultural. So now one thing, we didn't talk about this in the first week, but I think it's pretty significant. Jesus encounters this woman at noontime, and he encounters her at the well, which is the most important place in their town. Okay, and, and nobody else is around. So, so think about this. The well is the most important place and nobody's there. It's the hottest time of day. Meaning that most people actually probably would have gotten their water and gone home. So some scholars believe that the woman came at this time of day because she was avoiding people. She didn't want to be seen. Why didn't she want to be seen? Well, we learned, as, as Pastor Terry shared in her sermon last week, she, she was kind of an outcast. She was an outcast because she had had five husbands in the past, 
And, and, the, and the, the guy that she was living with right now was not her husband. This is all stuff that Jesus knew about her. She was scandalized in her culture. And, and, and she's probably there at noontime because she was avoiding nasty looks and insults and judgments. And I won't go into everything that they talk about again. We, we covered that in previous weeks. But basically, in this conversation, Jesus reveals that he knows everything about this woman. All of her flaws and all of her weakness. Like most of us, she has many. But he explains that he's come to offer her what he calls living water. He has come to give her eternal life. That's why Jesus is there. Again, this was unthinkable for him to offer to a Samaritan woman, of all people. See, the Jewish people at the time, they believed in a Messiah coming to bring salvation, but they thought it was for them, only them. And and, and so back in chapter 3 in the Gospel of John, Jesus makes clear that his mission is, is not a limited mission. Jesus' mission is not just to one people group. It's to everybody. Can you say everybody? Okay, this is his mission. And we read this in John three sixteen. He says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Life. So, so back to Jesus and this woman that he has encountered at the well. We're going to pick up at the end of the story. Jesus has just told her he came to bring her living water, eternal life, and then his disciples come back. They've got food finally. And, and we're going to, I'm going to start reading from verse 31. It says this, Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing of. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It is four months until harvest, I tell you. Open your eyes and look at the fields. Now, by the way, they're in Samaria. They never thought this was the field of harvest. (laughs) They are ripe for harvest even now. One who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, true. I sent you to reap that you ha- uh, what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Now I want to focus uh, a couple verses back. In verse 39 it says this. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Testimony. Can anybody tell me what is a testimony? What's a testimony? You can shout it out. An endorsement? A witness? So, so sometimes we think of this as a legal term, right? Right? Uh, It's used that way, um, but a testimony could just be a story. It's just a story that's told. Something powerful happened in this woman's life, and she encountered Jesus, and it radically changed her from a woman who didn't even want to be seen in public to somebody who was all over the town telling the story of what Jesus had done. She avoided everybody, but something in this encounter with the Savior of the world made her want to encounter people. And to share what happened to her. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? That is a powerful transformation. She couldn't help but share good news. Have you ever experienced something that you love so much that you can't shut up about it? Anybody love CrossFit here? People who like CrossFit love CrossFit. A couple years ago, I've shared this story before, but uh, we, we made a pit stop on a road trip by Lambert's Home of the Throat Rolls. 
And um, yeah, right? Um, so healthy eats for the whole family. Um, and and my, my middle son, uh, I, I think he was probably about nine or ten at the time, he, he tried, uh, what was it? Chicken and dumplings. Chicken and dumplings for the first time in his life. And when he tried it, it was like, it was like he encountered Jesus. <laughs> Because he just was like, this is so good. And he told his brothers, you got to try this. Mom, you got to try this. Dad, you got to try. He was stopping the waiter. You got to try this. That is what happened with this woman in her encounter. She couldn't help but share good news. She needed to tell about it. So, so after the past few weeks, what we've done here is we've explored this story from a lot of different angles. Here's what I want to do. I, I want to share some practical ways that we can live out what it means to, to share testimony, to share our story um, and, and to tell good news. Because here's the thing. If we come in here on Sunday morning and we read scripture and we sing songs and we eat a, a too many donuts, really, um, and then we go out on Monday and we go to work and we go to school and we haven't changed at all, why are we coming on Sunday? If, if we come in here and nothing is different about us, then, then you, you know what? I, I don't feel the need to come here. I want to be changed. I want to be transformed like this woman. And I want to go out and I want good news to come out of my lips on Monday morning. I want to tell a story, to tell a story that's going to transform the world. So that's really our mission as Christians, is to share good news, to share good news. That's your call as a believer. That's my call. That's the call of the church. And that's important because here's the thing. We live in a bad news world. We live in a bad news world. Bad news dominates in the headlines, on cable TV, on our social media feeds. In fact, psychologists will tell us that there is, uh, in our brains, we are hardwired for negativity. There's a phenomenon that psychologists call the negativity bias. And humans generally are drawn towards Negative more than positive. Uh, according to psychologist Dr. Monica Johnson, she spent her whole career kind of studying this negativity bias. Uh, this is what she says. As human beings, we tend to remember traumatic experiences better than positive ones. We tend to recall insults more than praise. Can I get an amen? React more strongly to negative stimuli. Think about negative things more frequently than positive things and respond more strongly, our reactions are more strong to negative event, events than equally positive ones. Equally positive. That is our negativity bias. Now remember I said earlier, Jesus' love is countercultural. Although there's nothing more countercultural in a world of bad news than to share good news. So what I want to talk about today is three ways we can share good news in a bad news world. Three ways we can share good news in a bad news world. And I'm going to go through these and then I'll unpack them a little. Some, some might sound a little strange to you at first, but I'll, I'll explain. The first one is this, and probably pretty obvious, to share good news about Jesus. Like this woman at the well, to share good news about Jesus. The second is this, share good news about others. And the third one is this, share good news about yourself to yourself. We'll get back to that one. Let's start with this first one. It really is the most important one because this is the call of the church to share good news about Jesus. It is our primary mission as followers of Jesus who've been changed and transformed by Jesus to bear witness to the goodness of God in our lives. Um, there's this churchy world, word called evangelism. In fact, I, I grew up in a church and they talked about evangelism all the time. In fact, when I was in Sunday school, they made us memorize a script in evangelism script, that we could go to people and we would have to share the script with somebody. And it basically told about the story of how Jesus came and died for your sins. And do you know where you're going if you were to die today? That was the kind of script they had us memorize. And, and, and here's the thing, maybe that works well for some people, but, but that's not what I saw in this story. What I saw in this story of the woman at the well was she shared her story. She shared the story of how Jesus changed her life and, and, and what, what happened? It changed the whole town. Her story changed everything. She didn't memorize a script. She shared her testimony. 
If you've encountered the love of Jesus, you can, change your, you can share your story. So a few years back, I read this book um, by uh, Dr. Francis Collins. Um, he, he just retired. He was the head of the uh, NIH, the National Institutes of Health, one of the greatest scientific minds of, of our time. He helped map the human genome. He's a brilliant guy. He wrote a book called The Fingerprints of God. In this book, he said when he was a young doctor, he was an atheist. Um, and he was working at that time when he j- had just gotten out of his training, mostly with terminal cancer patients in a rural setting. Um, and what caused him to become a Christian is a pretty powerful thing. When he was working with and talking to these terminal cancer patients, and they were facing down their own mortality, some of them facing down the last days that they would be on this earth. And, and, and he was blown away that they were constantly talking about the goodness of God constantly talking about the goodness of God and they had no fear no fear of where they were going after they passed on from this earth and and, and he said this he said that when when they would talk about their relationship with Jesus it just left this doctor who was so sure about the world dumbfounded Talk about light in dark places he said he could not deny the power of a love like that Good news changes lives. So number one, that is share good news about Jesus with the people around you. Share your story. That is primary for us as followers of Jesus. The second one is this. Because we live in a bad news world. Share good news about others. Share good news about others. Let me ask you this. When you talk about other people, be honest, do you tend to to share good news or bad news? What, where do you usually land? So, so I have a mentor, um, uh, and he's a pastor named, named Glenn. And, and we try to meet up pretty regularly. He, he recently took on an appointment in Kansas City, so now it's mostly over Zoom or by, by phone. But we talk about ministry, we talk about work, we talk about family, we talk about a lot of stuff. Um, it's great to have somebody that I can vent to. Glenn has a funny rule about if we talk about other people. Here's the thing. Now, he doesn't say I can't say negative things, but here's what he says. You can say something negative, but if you're going to say something negative, you've got to say three positive things first. If you're going to say something negative, you've got to say three positive things first. Now, he's actually on to something. There's a relationship expert named Dr. John Gottman. He says it takes seven positive statements to counter one negative. Seven positive statements to counter one negative. Why is that? Because of that negativity bias. Remember, our hurts are stronger than the kind words. Can you share good news about other people? Well, I like that some people can. (laughs) I, I, I like to call this good gossip. Good gossip. Could you share good gossip about the people around you? Could, could you share good things about the people around you? So that's number two, is, is to share good news about others. Now, the other one might sound a little, the last one that I'm going to share here is a little bit strange sounding, but I think it's important. Share good news about yourself with yourself. Now, here's the thing. Many of us look in the mirror and we tell ourselves nothing but bad news about ourselves. Anybody else? Anybody else do that? We create a self-narrative that tears ourselves down and, and, and it bears negative fruit in our lives and in our relationships and in our behaviors. And here's the weird part about this, okay? Because as part of our sinful nature, and we're all sinners, as part of our sinful nature, we're selfish. We think about ourselves all the time. And The weird thing about it is that human beings are at once self-obsessed and we really don't like ourselves very much. Isn't that strange? Uh, There's a writer named Anne Lamont and she says says it this way. I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. (laughs) The story that you tell yourself about yourself has a huge impact on how you feel and how you interact with the world. If you say I'm worthless... then that's going to impact all of your relationships, all of your behaviors. And here's the thing. That negative self-image is simply not how Jesus sees you. 
It is simply not how Jesus sees you. We read this in John 1 verse 12. It says this, Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the rights to become children of God. You are a child of God. That is how God sees you. You are beloved. And God loves you unconditionally and pursues you relentlessly. What if that's the story you could tell yourself when you see yourself? That you are precious to who? To the God of the universe. That if you were the only person on earth, he still would have come and given up his life for you. So share good news about Jesus. Share good news about others. Share good news about yourself to yourself. Now do you notice the acronym there of of those? Jesus, others, you. Have you ever seen that before? What is that? Can somebody say joy? joy? Can somebody say joy like they have joy in their heart? Joy. <laughs> Some of you sound more angry at me for asking you to say things out loud. Here's the thing. Jesus, when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? Do you remember what the greatest commandment was? To love God, Jesus. To love others how much? As much as you love Yourself, Jesus, others, and you. This is the priorities that, that, that God has set up for us. And we may, when we make a priority of sharing good news in that order, of Jesus, of others, and of ourselves, that kind of living, that kind of testimony, it changes everything. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you for your amazing love that changes everything. It transforms everything, God. We're nothing without you. But with you, Lord God, our whole world is made new and transformed. I pray, God, we could encounter you in a powerful and transformative way, even now, even this morning, Jesus. And I pray if if there is someone here who doesn't know you or someone who's joining us on our live stream who has never encountered you, Lord Jesus, I pray that they could know that they're precious to you and that you came so that they could know you, that they could be saved, that they could be set free from sin, from death, and that they could live a victorious life through you. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we could Come to know you in an even deeper way right now. I thank you for your goodness. Help us to tell good news in a bad news world, Jesus. Help us to shine light in dark places. We pray this in your name. Amen.